pretty eccentric group. For instance, um, Ulipo members, um, who are often mathematicians and other scientists and applying these rules to language, they could never leave Ulipo even when they died. They could only, the only way they could leave was by committing ritual suicide in presence of other Ulipo members. So it was a pretty eccentric group. It was a reaction to the Surrealist movement. Um, Raymond Cano had a falling out with André Breton, let's face it, who didn't. Um, <laughs> And the surrealist notion of creativity bubbling up from the subconscious, such as automatism and automatic writing, that was one of the things they wanted to challenge and do different things. So they actually applied mathematics, set theory, and what they call the Bourbaki movement. Um, and it was a bold experiment in syntactics and linguistic structure. Syntactics being not the meaning of individual science, but how you put them together. So as I said, Ulipo had its, its aim to apply constraints to writing. So um, they went further than just the formal rules of like the sonnet and the haiku. They actually delved into the work. So um, the rules for how words must be combined with other words, um, the alphabetic level, for example, anagrams, the syllable level, such as spoonerisms, where syllables for contiguous words are swapped to comic effect, for example, um, Jeremy Hunt, or should we say not? That isn't a proper spoonerism. Um, but um, spoonerisms are just ways of, of changing the, the syllables to create, create humour. Also, tautograms, where one, length, one, word, one letter can be used for the initial um, letter of each word. Lipograms, where one or more letters is forbidden. And there's a famous book by Georges Perec, who was also um, a very um, prominent member of the Ulipo movement, who wrote a book called The Disappearance, um, which lacked the letter E, so it's the opposite of, of what I'd, I'd done with that experimental poem. So the E appeared nowhere in the manuscript, and it was a protest allegory, I believe, for the disappearance of ordinary citizens doing the persecution of the Jews um, in France, the lead up to the Holocaust. And so he wondered how many people would notice that the E was missing. And that was, that was kind of a, an interesting sort of um, embedding of, of politics into poetry. So yeah, and there's palindromic poems that they took, they, 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 um, they um, attempt to do. So, for example, poems that read the same backwards as forwards, so a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. Don't try to work it out, trust me, it works. Mm -hmm. um, so there's palindromic, uh, applied Fibonacci sequences and, and stuff like that. So, um, essentially, um, this quote here, um, my understanding is it, it, it's the Ulipo school and Ulipo people that write poetry according to the Ulipo principles, they are like rats who construct a labyrinth from which they want to escape. Yeah. Um, essentially that is that, you know, when I decided to write a poem only, only with E in it, it was just an experiment. So obviously you've got that constraint and that kind of hems you in, but it, my understanding is, and this, I think this is the great thing about it, is that you come up with lines, I mean there's only about two lines I like in that, I think for me it's just actually writing a poem with only one vowel, I like the a couple of lines in it, but I think you never come up with those lines without the constraint. So I think... Um, if Lynn does a few more episodes to talk about why, why I like Ulipo, why it's interesting to me. So, on the face of it, Ulipo could seem like the enemy of creative freedom, all these mathematical rules, all this structure. Where's, where's the place for pathos? Where's the place for the bubbling up of emotion of, um, you know, the kind of the more right brain creative impulse that we all love in poetry that helps us express painful feelings? Well, um, on, on the face of it, this would seem anathema to the whole idea of a romantic genius, the Ulipo a priori rules. And often, as poets, we're taught that we, we actually take, we pick the form to suit the feeling. So a haiku, you're walking in the mountains and something happens with the weather, you might want to write a haiku. Uh, sonnets often are applied to love and other sort of internal monologues and feelings, soliloquies, etc., etc. If you're angry, you might, you might write slam poetry. But, I mean, I thought if we apply Ill algorithmic rules, you'd think you'd just always return turgid, ponderous and unfeeling art. Um, but essentially, I was thinking that you know, much art is actually built on underlying patterns. So like J.S. Bach, for example, his art of fugue, it ain't bad listening, you know? And essentially that was an experiment in chord structures. Um, the governing idea of the work was an exploration of counterpuntal possibilities inherent in a single musical subject. And he kept kind of playing with different keys and different ways of putting it together. So that was, again, an experiment where he came, and came at it with constraints and created an amazing piece of art. Similarly, much of Islamic decorative art is built on working out of ever more complex geometric shapes and interlocking tessellations. Um, and Arabic calligraphy, which appears in the same format, is florid, but subject to morphological rules, elusive ligatures, the aleph, the correct diacritical marks, and it has to spell correctly. But yet, that creates amazing florid arabesques and roseate motifs that we all enjoy. If you've been to the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, you know, I'm talking about Estefan in, in, in Iran. Um, 
So, you know, that hasn't hardly led to shabby interiors. So, I mean, I actually think that applying rules can sometimes help creators feel less overwhelmed by the vertigo of possibilities, the extensions with Havoc. Because often when you have an open brief, you're not sure what to do. Um, the advertising copyright of David Ogilvy was famously quoted as having declared, give me the, the, the freedom of a tight brief. And I see the um, Unipro rules as, as, as part of that as well. And I'm writing a novel at the minute, and I think having um, some kind of mechanism for creating um, possibilities and chapters is, is really important. I mean, George Perret wrote his book, um, Life and um, a User's Manual, and he did it using a fiendish formula generated by matrices and chess moves. I mean, it sounds mad, but, you know, he had a certain number of objects and certain characters, and they had to combine in certain ways. He didn't determine how they were combined. He used random um, algorithms to do that, and that helped him move forward. So, um, I will not to spend too long, just to say, um, you know, I, I chose this because I find that um, living in the UK, one thing I like about France is that they do believe in ideas and idealism. And one thing I love, well, whilst I love the sense of humour in the UK, I do think there's a rather narky, cynical, undercutting side. And I like the fact that French people in general have big visions. This is a massive stereotype, but certainly in literature. The Ulipo School absolutely sums that up. It's the madness, the chutzpah of applying these rules to poetry. It almost seems like juxtaposition of two different things. I really like the idea. And it's the most, the thing most designed to rile an English, English person. I'm not particularly English myself. I am English, but I'm not in that sense. I like to be positive about stuff. Um, and, um, and I think, um, you know, Eeyore-ish, I love it to laugh at, and Blackadder and all that stuff, but it gets really wearing when you've got ideas. I think this country's not really particularly positive in that sense. And I think France probably is, certainly in the States is. Um, yeah, and um, finally, just to say, I'm, I'm a hip-hop head, I love hip-hop, and it's funny that you wouldn't expect Ulipo and hip-hop to have anything in common, but I think... Um, you know, there's a puzzle, a puzzling mentality to Ulipo. Once you've got the constraints, whatever it might be, a palindrome, having a lipogram where you need to spell a word um, with the first line of every line that goes across, downwards. All these things are about lexical feet. So if you look at people like the Jizzer who, who rhymes um, one of his raps of three minutes, he rhymes all the NFL football teams into it, but tells the narrative at the same time. That's pretty impressive to me, and to make it sound good is actually quite hard. You know, other stuff like alphabet stuff is, is a bit easier, but again, Ulipo stuff does that. Um, so anyway, I've been going on for a while. I'm going to end, though, by just doing a little bit of tribute to Raymond Cano. I'm just going to have a little experiment now in the spirit of Ulipo. So Raymond Cano, um, his most famous and impressive work was entitled 100,000 Billion Poems. Don't worry, I'm not going to read the <laughs> part tonight. Lock the doors, please. Um, so, but what I thought we'd do is, essentially it involves, um, he wrote 10 sonnets of the standard 14 lines, the 886 structure, right? But the conceit being that um, for each line, it could be combined with any of the other lines. So essentially what he did originally was he had a book of a folio like this with recto and verso and he cut the strips down the 14 lines so what you could do is you could read the first line of the top sheet and then for the second thing kind of pull over the first three and read the second line of the fourth and then read maybe the third line of the seventh and the fourth line and so you, you get the impression so what I'm going to do is just read um, maybe one or two poems and I'm going to hand out these sheets I've got ten sheets each of them has a sonnet on it we're going to go through each of the, four, the lines. I'm going to get a noosh at random to generate a number, and we're going to get you to read the line. Okay, everyone know more or less what you're doing? Yeah. It will come clear. All right. <laughs> so, so, we've got number one over here. Number two, Tom, you take that. Karina, take number three. Three. Seven, two. Thank you. Number five. Five, um, are you five? Okay. Oh, Okay, what you've noticed, well you wouldn't have noticed because you haven't got all ten to look at, but each of the lines ends in the same vowel sound, because that's how you can combine them. And they were written in such a way that there could be some meaning, so it's not just a randomly correct, um, collected series of lines. He had a narrative and thread such that 
he, he, he saw there was some thread of meaning no matter what lines you, you pick. But I thought we just, yeah. we have an experiment. So it's line one. Um, one to ten, Anoush, just pick a number. Eight. Eight, okay, he's got eight. Okay, <laughs> gentlemen, would you like, would like to write, read the first line of your page? That every verbal shock aims to deprave. That every verbal shock aims to deprave. Okay, keep that in your head. So, line two, can you pick a number? Five. Five, who's got five? Oh, oh sorry, is it your name? <laughs> <laughs> we, we both think we've got five. We could read it together. There's a little Let's number at the bottom, actually, on the bottom right. There's a little number at the bottom right. Is there? Oh, I'm four. Okay, good one, um, sir. So, every, any line? Yeah. Embobbled minds may puff and blow and guess. Embobbled minds may puff and glow and guess. And guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not going to try and remember all these lines, but so number three. Can you pick a number? Um, um seven. Seven. He's got seven. Fertile mother, changeling drops like king. Fertile mother, changeling. Changeling drop like drops like kings. James drops like kings. Okay. <coughs> Interesting. I, I'm seeing I'm seeing a thread here, a really strong thread. Um, okay, fourth line. Number nine. Number nine. Yeah, the fourth line, yeah. The wolves devour both sheep and shepherdess. The wolves devour both sheep and shepherdess. Sounds quite similar to your poem. Interesting. Okay, line five. Number three. Number three. The Frisian Isles, my friends, are cherished things. The Frisian? The Frisian Isles, my friends, are cherished things. The Frisian Isles, my friends, are cherished things. Okay. Line six. Number six. Number six. <clears throat> Filching the lolly, country thrift helps save. Filching the lolly, country, <laughs> country thrift helps help help save. Interesting. Okay, we're on to line seven. Number two. Number two. The Turk said, just take anything you please. <laughs> the Turk said, take anything you please. Okay. Number four. Number four. This is line eight. To a fireman come with hose piped tidal wave. To a fireman come with hose piped tidal wave. Yeah. Nine. Number one. Number one. It's line nine. An icicle of frozen marrow pings. An icicle of frozen marrow pings. Pings. Pings, okay. Line ten, number? Number five. Number five. Breaking voice across the Alps, they slug. Breaking voice across the Alps, they slug. 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 Okay, this is line eleven. We also line eleven. Or ten, no, yeah, eleven. Eleven. Yeah. Number? Um, number, number twelve? Is there a number twelve? No, there isn't. It's one to ten. Because, but I think that's yeah. number, um, eight? Did eight. you have number eight? Yes. We'll have to repeat because they're fourteen lines. No. Number eight? So it's, not, it's like line eleven. Whoever's got number eight, three. Three lines. Call Parnassus down to Wild Lock Ness. Call cool Parnassus down to Wild Lock Ness. Mm. Okay. Um, number five. Number five, line twelve. Oh, again? Yeah, again. <laughs> um, one gathers rosebuds or grows old alone. One gathers mm. rosebuds or dies all alone. Grows old. Grows old alone. Okay, line thirteen, the ultimate line. Number three. Number three. On fish, slab, whale, nor seal has never swum. <laughs> On fish. On fish, slab, whale, nor seal has never swum. Slab. <laughs> That's the hardest thing to remember. It's like a mental block. Okay, and the 14, line 14? Number 2. Number 2. Platonic Greece was not so talentless. Platonic Greece, Greece. was not so talentless. Was not so talentless. <laughs> okay. Great, well I was going to put them all on one sheet, probably would have been a bit easier, more continuity there. But um, I think it was a great achievement anyway to come up with all these sonnets and have some kind of line of reasoning. I would, I would urge you to go online, there's actually a, um, a website where you can flip through the lines and they just kind of roll a through like an um, airport destination.
lenticulus that's really worth looking at. Um, anyway, Ulipo, crazy world, um, but French and inspiring poetry for me, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.